Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. The Delta and Omicron variants of the COVID-19 virus changed the course of the pandemic and led to a dramatic increase in the number of cases globally. And it's unclear if new mutations will bring us small waves of infections, hospitalisations and deaths to quite the same degree. Preliminary evidence from laboratory research suggests people who were infected with the original version of Omicron uh, being reinfected by the subvariants. More on that shortly. Let's get the latest data for now, though, with Casey Briggs. Casey. Hi, Jeremy. So we've just entered the throes of winter and Australia has just clicked over 7.5 million cases of SARS-CoV-2 confirmed since this pandemic began. Here's the latest case curve for the country. And really, Australia has been experiencing this sort of undulating curve now for a few months with, you know, case numbers oscillating between the mid 50,000s and, you know, as low as the high 20,000s. It looks like we might be maybe approaching sort of a, a local minimum in that undulation at the moment. And case numbers right now are at the lowest they've been since the early days of March. Uh, in terms of hospitalisations, we are seeing a slow and gradual descent uh, in the hospital burden at the moment. And in terms of deaths, the number there, well, it's no longer growing. It's about 43 or 44 deaths a day with COVID in Australia, uh, which is a higher number than I think that most people might have predicted when we were talking about opening up this country and moving to a sort of COVID normal state as far back as this time uh, last year. Of course, uh, with a lot more COVID in the community, it's likely there is a lot more interaction of the virus with other conditions happening far more than we've uh, ever seen before. And as we're in this kind of normalising COVID state, we need to also think not just about COVID, but, you know, the burden of disease more generally in 2020, 2021. We had this singular focus on the pandemic. Now we don't just have COVID, we have all sorts of other respiratory diseases circulating. And let me just show you one of them, and that's the flu. Uh, the influenza season this year is shaping up to be a big one. This chart is the number of uh, lab confirmed cases in the year to date. We've had 55,000 of them uh, this year already. And, and of course, that only counts the people who have been lab confirmed, have been tested and counted. And we know a lot of people are not getting their flu cases confirmed by a laboratory. That's the blue line. This yellow line is the flu season last year. Well, what flu season? We basically had none of this virus um, circulating around. So as we're expecting quite a lot more cases to emerge in the weeks and months ahead, there's this flu vaccination drive happening. About a third of Australians have had their flu jabs so far this year. That number rises to more than two thirds of people over 65. That's good to see. And those are good numbers compared to previous flu seasons. But when we're expecting a bad one this year, Jeremy, those numbers could be better. Casey, thank you. Let's bring in Dr Norman Swan. Norman, let's talk about that very steep curve with the flu first. How is that playing into the way Omicron, the way Delta COVID is playing out in the health system? Well, you know, you're seeing a tailing off in the numbers at the moment, whether or not that goes up again. But there's a lot of COVID around and there's a lot of flu around. You don't want to get the two together. There's also an immunisation rates that... The immunisation rates are still very low for influenza as a population. Yes, 7 out of 10 people aged over 65 have had their immunisation. Uh, that's great, but the younger group who are particularly... At, this is a, um, an outbreak in predominantly younger people um, and they're not being immunised at the same rate. Do we know why that is? Because we've been talking about vaccinations and inoculations for the best part of two years. Why is that rate still so low? I think people think the flu is not a serious disease. I think they are fed up with immunisations and coming forward. But it's never been that good. Um, yes, we, we, we tend to have achieved 70% of the over 65s, but we've never achieved very high levels <coughs> in the population as a whole. So we're seeing the typical pattern. And what's unfortunate is that people don't seem to have learnt the lesson. Let's talk about COVID and how our vaccinations, the third doses around Australia, have been going and why, what role that has in the figures that we're seeing now, these high rates of infection. Well, you've got several things coming together. So you've got Omicron, which is more vaccine resistant, particularly the later variants. Um, and what that means is that where you, vaccines might have protected you to the extent of maybe 90% against severe disease and death, maybe even higher against death, 
with um, Delta, for example, with uh, Omicron, it's probably down about 80%. So 20% of people who are immunized are more vulnerable. But you've got to have three doses to be at the maximum. And the only state in Australia that's doing well with third doses is Western Australia, are doing really well with 80% of eligible people um, immunized. Everywhere else, it's low. If you extrapolate from now, uh, as to when, say, Victorians and New South Wales people would actually be fully be third, get their third dose. It's July, June, July of 2023. That's how slowly it is. That means there's a lot of people in Australia who are under immunised and vulnerable to infection, as well as it being vaccine evasive. So there's just a lot of people around who are vulnerable to this these some variants. And again, is that just this sense that it's not as big a problem as it used to be? I think it was the language, particularly the federal government to begin with, saying this is a mild virus. I think people think that Omicron is not a bad virus. Well, as Casey just showed, it's 40 deaths a day. And in fact, what recent data suggests is, um, in fact, according to the federal government, previous federal government's own um, criterion of excess deaths. What's the excess deaths? Well, first two months of this year alone, 5,000 excess deaths, and some of them are going to be due to, uh, to COVID. We're genuinely seeing more people dying than otherwise would. And I don't think people are fired up enough about it. Um, for those of us who are third dose vaccinated, how, how big is the effect of the waning immunity? It's, well, first of all, well, it's significant. Um, so so the, um, the protection against severe disease does wane. It doesn't wane hugely, but it does wane. Um, but getting the third dose really takes you back to at least as high as the second dose did, if not higher. And the fourth dose for those who are eligible take you up pretty high as well. So it's, it's, it's good news getting the vaccine and everybody should come forward and get it. You do not want to get sick. Because we've got so many people in Australia immunised, most people who get seriously ill will be immunised just by statistics. Um, but, you know, it's still very bad to be under immunised because you are more vulnerable. Norman, it's great to have you in. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Now, let's bring in epidemiologist Professor Angela Webster from the University of Sydney. Angela Webster, welcome to the program. Can you tell us about these variants that are currently circulating in Australia? How bad are they? How infectious are they? Well, the, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the variants that are circulating at the moment have been noted overseas and have now been detected in, in Australia. They're all what we call sub-variants of the original Omicron. So rather than being completely different branches of the tree, like Delta was different from Alpha, was different from Omicron, these are kind of small twigs that are developing off the back of the original Omicron strain. So that's why they're called sub-variants. We have noted that there have been episodes where some of the sub-variants of Omicron have combined together so that suggests that people have been infected with more than one, one uh, subvariant at the same time. We've also seen increasingly with the, with the more recent subvariants, four and five, that they seem to be evading immune response more. They seem to be causing more reinfections with people who've had earlier variants, including the original Omicron strain. Why is it that Omicron is the one that's um, mutating here? Uh, I think, well, all, all of the variants of, um, of uh, COVID have, have, have mutated at roughly the same rate. It's still a lot slower than something like flu mutates. Uh, but the, the very number of uh, infections, Omicron has become the dominant variant around the world. And uh, because there's so much infection, but relatively mild, milder disease. It's not a mild disease at all, but it's relatively milder than the earlier strains, and we have more protections now through vaccination and treatments. What about the degree of illness, particularly when someone is picking up and carrying two subvariants at the same time? Does that result in more illness? It depends very much on the person with the infection. We do know that some people are particularly vulnerable, those who have um, immunosuppressive conditions who haven't been able to react well to the vaccines. They don't get such a strong response. Those people are very vulnerable because they tend to become infected and remain infected for longer. Um, they also have had some, there's been some cases of people having both Omicron, COVID and flu together. I myself have looked after some in, in, in my hospital work. So um, those people can become extremely unwell, but it generally depends, they're generally vulnerable anyway. So they're older or they have other um, serious medical conditions that mean that they are much more susceptible to infection and infection complications and much less protected by the vaccines, even though they may have sought out their fourth or even fifth vaccine where eligible.
Do we expect at this point then that because of the spread of those subvariants that there will just be more subvariants, more variants emerging over time? Well, where there's a lot of infection around, there'll be a lot more chances of new mutations around. And that's what the WHO and uh, related agencies, including national agencies in Australia, uh, monitor all the time. They have variants of interest, which are variants that have arisen that in monitoring people have discovered and realised that they help hold some kind of sign that they may be more transmissible or they may evade either diagnosis or treatment or immune responses that we've built. Um, and once they realise that the, the from there the variant can be upgraded, if you like, to a variant of concern. Uh, we know that um, over the course of the last few years people have really become quite fatigued about this idea of lockdowns and COVID and talking about hospitalisations and death. Uh, for you, as someone who studies this, what do you think are the right policy settings in an environment like this? Well, policy mandates are never designed to be permanent um, and we've certainly had temporary severe restrictions on our lives that have worked and slowed disease particularly in Australia enough that we could get vaccinated before um, before uh, the, the infection became more widespread. I think it's very sensible to mask up still. We know that reduces transmission uh, and it stops infected people spreading the virus and to a certain degree stops people catching infection. So masking in indoor areas, particularly in the winter when it's cold, when we know COVID spreads more easily and there's other viruses around like flu, like RSV, like other winter viruses. And I think masking in, in, in closed spaces, including public areas, public transport, aeroplanes, that kind of thing is, is extremely sensible. And I would, I would suggest that that's the, that's the kind of um, personal action and uh, a highly suggested kind of restriction that should be continued. Professor Angela Webster, thank you so much for your analysis on the program. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Now, the ABC's medical reporter Sophie Scott joins us now to answer your questions about COVID. How long am I infectious for after having COVID? The answer to this really depends on how sick you are and how good your immune system is. Most people with COVID will have a mild illness and recover in just a few days. Generally, you're considered to be infectious 48 hours before symptoms start. And you're probably most infectious in the first three days of your symptoms. If you get COVID and it's mild, you should be recovered and symptom free by seven days. It's difficult to know exactly when you stop being contagious. Even having symptoms isn't a perfect guide. Experts say if someone is carrying the virus who's coughing and sneezing, there's a greater chance you'll spread it. So stay at home to avoid transmitting the virus to other people. If people in the same household test positive at the same time, should they isolate from each other? Yes, absolutely. The people who live with you can stay there if they can't be somewhere else. But if they stay with you, they're then considered close contacts. The requirements for close contacts vary in different states and territories. The general advice is if you have COVID, you should stay in a separated, well-ventilated room away from other people. If you can't isolate, you should avoid shared spaces in the house as much as possible. Wear a mask in shared areas. Wipe down any surfaces that you touch. If you can, use a separate bathroom that other people are not using. Don't have any visitors over unless they're providing medical care or emergency services. And have all your groceries and other essential items delivered to your home. That way you're minimising the risk of spreading the virus to other people in the house. Who is eligible for the antiviral medication? There are oral antiviral drugs and some which are delivered in hospital for people who are sicker. It's up to your GP to decide whether you're eligible to get the medications. You're more likely to get an antiviral if you're aged over 65 and have two risk factors for severe disease, or if you're aged over 75 and have one risk factor. You are also more likely to be prescribed the drugs if you have a compromised immune system, and if you're an Indigenous person aged over 50 with two risk factors. Doctors are prescribing antiviral drugs to people living in aged care and disability care and rural and remote areas. It's important to remember antiviral drugs need to be given in the first five days of your illness. So speak to your doctor if you think you might be eligible. 
And if you want your questions answered, go to the coronavirus section of the ABC News website and click on Ask Us Your Question. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.